This podcast is supported by Manitou Fund. We want to thank them for coming on board and, and helping to support this podcast. It really means a lot to us. I've been telling Zach he needs to get some chicken. So here you go, Zach. Now's your chance. Well, uh, that his his talking about these chickens here really reminded me of a, a very important question. Do you guys all know the best way to pick up chicks? <laughs> I do not. I don't. With your legs, not your back. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Dad jokes. <laughs> Dad jokes for days. I'm Mitchell Hora, a farmer from Iowa. And I am Zach Johnson, a farmer from Minnesota. And of course, if you're tuning in, you probably already know that this is the Fieldwork Podcast, which is a podcast brought to you by farmers for farmers. But you don't have to be a farmer to listen to this podcast. No, you don't have to be a farmer, but our show is all about the benefits and challenges of sustainable agriculture. That's right. So a lot of people are interested in that. And today, we're actually going to talk to two brothers who see regenerative ag as a way to keep their family's farm afloat. And now that the coronavirus hit, we're going to dig into a little bit on how the outbreak is impacting their farm as well. Tim and Tyler Nuss both grew up on Nuss Farms in Northern California. They both have day jobs off the farm, but they've been working with their father, Dave, to bring more regenerative egg practices onto their farm. One of those day jobs is hosting the Modern Acre podcast. So I just realized that hosting a podcast is a real job. This is awesome. Hey, uh, well, that's exciting why? to find out. That's huge. That, put that on your resume, Zach. Um, <laughs> What's hey, a uh, resume? <laughs> you don't need resumes as farmers, I guess. That's fine. Um, okay, so the Modern Acre, though, is their show, and they highlight the newest innovations and technologies in the agribusiness industry. So we got Tim and Tyler Nuss here with us. Why don't, Tim, start us off. Uh, tell us about the farm, what you guys are growing. Yeah, so on the family farm, we have about 800 acres that we farm on our home ranch. We rent some properties around us as well, but we main, mainly grow um, specialty vegetable crops. So we have garlic, sunflowers, cucumbers, tomatoes, corn, some wheat. Um, any given year, we have about five to seven different commodities that we're kind of strategically rotating around the, around the ranch. Back us up a little bit. Tell us about some of the history of the farm, um, the operation as it sits today, and what's everybody's kind of roles, and how does that work out in the family operation? Go ahead, Tyler. Totally. So we've actually been farming. Tim and I and our oldest brother, three brothers, re- represent the fifth generation of the of the farm of farming in our family, and we've been on our specific land for almost fifty years. And so Tim and I grew up in and around agriculture. Uh, I thought I was going to be a farmer when I grew up. I uh, was super passionate about it. And then as you grow up in it, you you see some of the hardships, right? The the stress that it takes um, on our on our dad specifically, the the dependence on weather conditions and market conditions. And so Tim and I, you know, both went away from the farm, um, sought degrees. I studied engineering. Tim studied business. I got into the tech industry. And, t- and Tim got into the produce industry doing um, import export category management, so kind of focused on international trade. And we, we, you know, we would talk periodically to our dad about the farm, um, but it was kind of at that removed level. And that's when, you know, a few years ago, Tim and I got more interested in what was happening on the farm, where were we going, um, you know. To give a little context, we've been growing vegetables pretty much for the duration of, of the farm and scaled up a large asparagus, vertically integrated asparagus operation back a decade or two ago, which was a big commodity in the in the northern central valley of California. And with with NAFTA and with labor challenges in California and in the country, um, that that operation um, just went went down and there was a, a lot of financial struggle um, associated with that. Um, just you you go in the area today, you, you'll see no asparagus. It basically wiped out um, that commodity in the area. And it's it's if you see asparagus on the shelf in stores, it's 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 most likely coming from Mexico and other parts of the world. Um, so I was really unfortunate, but it really caused 
us to reevaluate and to our dad and Derek, our oldest brother's credit, who are on the farm full time, they've been bringing the farm back to profitability um, year over year, um, not working with a lot of capital, having to do deals that are you know more conservative, but less risky and bringing Tim and I into it a few years ago as we started asking questions of, OK, we've gotten to this point, but where are we going for the, for the next 50 years? Um, we felt like there wasn't a great place to really learn what was going on in the industry and the space. And that's where the idea of the Modern Acre, our, our podcast, came from, was really to develop a space where people our age, the next generation, could really learn from each other and see what people were doing in the space. And so as a result of that, we got connected to a lot of smart people and talking to, to different leaders in the industry um, and, and learned about regenerative agriculture. Right. This this word that we all talk about. And so it was through the podcast we started having those conversations. And then at the same time, we were getting more involved in the family farm and having more strategic level conversations about our, our how do we differentiate ourselves? How do we go to market, et cetera? And, and started ha- talking to our dad more about regenerative agriculture. Tech. So so our dad and oldest brother, Derek, are on the f- farm full time doing the doing the dirty work. There's actually an ongoing joke that I'm afraid of dirt. Um, I'm the black sheep that went off to the Silicon Valley. So um, uh, my my expertise and, and skill sets a little little different. So you talked a little bit, Tyler, there about uh, how, you know, you had these struggles and, and it sounds like the entire asparagus industry had these struggles and you had to take kind of take a look at what you were doing with your operation and reevaluate some stuff and kind of look at things differently. I mean, either one of you go ahead and take this, but what were some of the key differences that you made in your operations? I mean, what were those changes that were really effective for you? Yeah, so one of the biggest changes was basically just kind of readdressing the marketplace with with the asparagus. We had invested a lot of capital into the infrastructure to to plan that crop. Um, asparagus is in the ground for the beds last anywhere from 10 to 15 years. So we had about half of our acreage in asparagus. So being that committed to any one commodity, I think, opened our eyes to being more differentiated and not having all of our eggs in one basket. So your dad's been around the farm a long time and he's still really active in the operation. Uh, what were his thoughts when you guys brought these ideas to the farm? Yeah, this is this is Tyler. It's it's a super fun and uh, super proud <laughs> uh, topic for me to discuss because you know our dad is an old school farmer, right? I mean, I, we grew up valuing hard work, um, you know, character, um, really the value of the land, family. And um, he's he's always been that way um, and really emphasized, you know, character and doing the right thing. And um, but he's he's old school. He gives me a hard time. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of dirt. Um, I, I, I didn't put in the enough hours at the farm in my youth and, and all these things. And so it's been such an interesting evolution of, of conversation. I remember, you know, a year ago asking my dad about glyphosate and just, you know, dad, what do you think about glyphosate? what are your thoughts there? And I kind of getting the eye roll. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know what I'm talking about with, with respect to, to input application and some of these things. And the conversation has definitely evolved. And, and Tim and I have been, as we've learned through the podcast and through our network, more about the principles of regenerative agriculture. And um, we were a uh, kiss the ground is a nonprofit that really promotes regenerative agriculture. And we were um, part of their, um, scholarship program, or we're part of their ongoing scholarship program. And as part of that, they provide free education to farmers, which is super cool, along with soil testing. And so we got our soil tested last year. And um, one of the, the education resources was Soil Health Academy, which is um, basically a three-day event. And it's it's put on by Gabe Brown, who's one of the pioneers of regenerative, as, as I'm sure you guys know. And so we asked our dad if he would go to it. So we had kind of been planting the seeds, uh, no pun intended there, with him about regenerative and the benefits and, you know, really focused on profitability and sustainability uh, for the for the business operation. And our dad, to his credit, um, I think, is is open minded and wants to innovate and, and knows that we can't keep operating the same way we have. So he went to Soil Health Academy. And and I think that was a really big uh, turning point for him to, to connect with Gabe and Alan Williams and Ray Archuleta and these guys that speak kind of the same language, but are talking about things like soil health and carbon sequestration. And so that was a that was a key turning point for him, and now it, it's it's really funny and awesome to see we'll have suppliers out to the farm, and our dad are telling you know 
25 year old kids about regenerative and about soil health and about tillage and, and, and these things. So it's been, it's been a pretty awesome evolution, but I think it's, it's been instrumental for us to go this direction to have our dad really be on board and, and be open minded to some of these things. Yeah, I've seen the same kind of thing. And my dad and I attended a Soil Health Academy together a uh, little over two years ago as well. Um, one that uh, we hosted with one of the farmers that I work with here in Southeast Iowa. And yeah, a huge, huge um, benefit to us being able to work together in this effort. So Tyler, dig one step further into that, that you're talking about regenerative and the principles, but more specifically, what principles have you guys actually been implementing? Totally. So we kind of jumped in for in head first with this whole regenerative transition, uh, much to um, our dad's credit of being open to it. We we started with our first cover crop. I actually hopped on the tractor myself, uh, much to everyone's surprise, and and helped plant our first cover crop. It was a, a mustard mix, and so we did that in the in the winter. And so we're we're going to start introducing covers uh, where it makes sense in the off season and and really focus by crop, you know, how how we can focus on cover crop selection that really um, provides the most value. And then most notably is this year we're actually in partnership with a pasture raised poultry producer called Pasture Bird, and they're doing wholesale, wholesale pasture raised poultry and so we have a partnership with them where it's a little bit of an R&D phase where we're developing and scaling the concept of taking a field of our rotation. So similar to how we rotate, you know, garlic, tomatoes, cucumbers, we're inserting pasture raised poultry into that rotation. And the idea there is it's it's livestock integration, but at scale. So um, as we systematically move the chicks through movable coops through the field, they're invigorating and restoring the health of the soil. And so it gets really exciting when we talk about soil health. And then when it comes to nutrient density on vegetables to come behind that pasture for a one to two year period and then um, come in with vegetables, um, it, it becomes a very exciting prospect of, of how we can tell that story and the corresponding health benefits of that vegetable to, to be a, a flagship farm uh, in that sense. As we look at regenerative agriculture and, you know, we, we talk a little bit a lot of the times on this podcast about what that may or may not mean to some people. But we talk a lot to farmers in the Midwest and, and farmers at larger scales, but we haven't really talked to a ton of vegetable farmers. So, Tim, I'm curious, what are your thoughts as far as, you know, how regenerative might be different for vegetable farmers and to you guys on your farm? Yeah, we're really looking at it on a on a crop by crop basis on on a crop like garlic, for instance, we plant that at the end of summer and it's in the ground almost 10 months before we harvest. So when it's in the ground 10 months, it's going to be very hard to get a cover crop in in between that that cycle. So we're basically looking at all the crops we grow and of the regenerative principles, what makes sense given given that crop some some crops like cucumbers and tomatoes we're growing in in furrows and they're they're furrow irrigated not on on flat land. So we're kind of taking which principles make sense for that crop and um, matching those to them. Yeah. And if I can, if I can add to it, I think regenerative at its core, in my opinion, is about building the soil, right? So, so that's, that's our emphasis is how do we, without major disruptions to our, op our current operations, slowly start to introduce regenerative practices. So, you know, Gabe Brown has his six, six points of, of regenerative. So just to add to what Tim was saying is, Implementing cover crops where we can, um, thinking about tillage strategies of vertical till, drill, and up to no-till. And we're, we're working with understanding ag and Ray Archuleta to work through about, you know, what does make sense from a tillage standpoint. And then in addition, I think what's key for us that, that's a little different is the livestock integration. So, so incorporating the poultry into our rotation is a, is a key way going back to what I said at the beginning of, of building the soil, right? So I think we're thinking through all those things. And then as a result of, of building the soil, the, the hope and the goal is that we can over time reduce our reliance on inputs, right? So it, it's all these things working together and, and to just started this process, right? We just, we just jumped in head, head, head first in 2019, um, started looking at cover crops, got livestock 
integrated and and we're kind of hitting the ground running running from here. So admittedly, over the next five, 10 years, it's going to be a process and it's going to be an evolution of, of how we ultimately, again, build the soil. Well, Zach, great conversation here. But before we go on, we've got to take a quick break. We'll be back right after this. And welcome back to the Fieldwork Podcast. I'm Mitchell Hora. And I'm Zach Johnson. We're going to continue our conversation here with Tim and Tyler Nuss, two brothers who host the Modern Acre Podcast and are also partners in Nuss Farms in Northern California. So I've got to ask, you know, as California farmers, how does just that stigma, I guess, factor into uh, your focus on regenerative? Totally. It's interesting you you asked that because I think that's something that comes up a lot in our conversations on the podcast. I'm sure you guys experience it as well is is how do you scale regenerative agriculture? That that comes up quite a bit. And, you know, a lot of what I've seen in the space is especially specifically on, on vegetable production is there's a lot of more uh, small scale farmers. So far, farming a half acre or a few acres that are doing intensive regenerative agriculture practices, but it, it's it's manual, it's small scale. And so Tim and I are really thinking about how we how we take that to the next level, specifically in vegetables and, and how do you apply these principles at scale. So so it's it's definitely something that comes up and, and I don't think we've seen a ton of people in the space do it. Right? Possibly because they're too large to pivot. Um, when you, we're at a we're at a unique size of about a thousand acres, where we're 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 big, we're production hag, but we're not too big to 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 be nimble and flexible. Have you guys taken anything from your Modern Acre podcast and been able to implement that on your farm? Anything that you've learned? Yeah, definitely. I mean the the poultry project that we've been talking about that actually came on um, as a result of the podcast. We'd had their their founder on the podcast about a year ago. And last fall, he reached out talking about kind of expanding their program in Northern California. And if we knew of any farmers that were interested in kind of exploring what they were talking about. And coincidentally, we were interested. Not perfect on how it all actually comes through and comes full circle on that standpoint. Um, With maybe keeping on that, like with the Modern Acre podcast, um, what are you guys looking to explore here now? Um, what are some of the main focuses or main feedback that you guys are getting um, in terms of what are people asking about? Totally. I, I think the, the emphasis for the, the podcast is, is business building, right? So it's, it's whoever, wherever you're at in agriculture, whether you're on the farm or you're off the farm building an ag tech company or a direct-to-consumer brand, how are you going about building your business, what technologies are you using and what marketing strategies are you leveraging? So that's really the emphasis of the show and something that I think we've, we've leveraged ourselves of just how, how to tell a story, how to market yourselves and, and how to be different in this, in this world of agriculture. Um, question really for both of you guys, but Tim, we'll start with you. Um, based on now what you guys have learned and what you guys have implemented, what is your vision for the next 10, 20, 40 years for your farm? Yeah, I think our vision for the farm is to definitely kind of improve the the commodities that we're growing from a from a price standpoint about getting trying to get a regenerative premium on what we're currently growing. So I think on some of our acreage using the the, the same commodities we've been doing, but have a buyer that values the regenerative story that we're trying to tell and have a premium ingredient line. And then also having a portion of our acreage that we're directly marketing to consumers where we have kind of fresh market vegetables that we have developing our own brand. So kind of a, a blended model. And, and I think I think to to add to that a little more high level, we we want to help be the proving ground for regenerative at scale for for vegetable production. Uh, we were mentioning it earlier. A lot of this is unknown. A lot of this is evolving of how this is going to be executed. And we we want to be the the farm that helps figure it out. So working with strategic partners, be it on the equipment side or be it on the input um, side, we want to to help learn this and work through some of these challenges together with, with partners that are seeing the future of regenerative agriculture. So we definitely have big ambitions to, to be a, a flagship farm uh, in that sense. So to keep digging off of that, uh, the perspective going into agriculture right now is in a very interesting uh, outlook based on the coronavirus pandemic that we are right in the middle of. 
how is that impacting your farm? Um, but also the conversations that you're having on the modern acre. Yeah, it's it's interesting that the coronavirus hasn't affected us um, too too much on the farm, but um, being subject to to working with processors and buyers, um, their demand is is kind of our demand. So we have seen some acreage reductions coming up this year, where just the, within the past couple of weeks, where acreage that we had slotted for a couple of different commodities is getting cut back. So it kind of puts us in a difficult position, um, basically having to adjust now that we're here in in mid April trying to decide what we're going to do for the rest of the year. So we've been impacted um, from that standpoint for sure. And I think that's, that's just another, another reason why we're doing what we're doing with respect to this transition and emphasis and, and trying to go direct to consumer is, you know, how do we diversify? Obviously we've talked about diversification of crop mix, but there's also a diversification of your business model. So we're thinking about how we can, on one end of the spectrum, focus on, you know, these grower contracts and, and how do we get higher value and premium as a regenerative ingredient. But then on the other side of the spectrum is how do we actually sell uh, fresh produce and products directly to consumers? So this whole coronavirus, I think, is just um, really pushed us further in this direction and understanding we need to take some of this control back to ourselves. Yeah, it's going to be really, really interesting to see where exactly we go with this uh, COVID coronavirus situation. I mean, I just think, you know, not just uh, state by state or from farmer to farmer, even even in the U.S., I just think the whole world has yet to see what's going to happen with all this. It's It's going to be interesting as it plays out here over the next few months. Well, Zach, again, uh, of course, a really interesting conversation here with uh, some farmers from California. So, Check that one off the list. We are going nationwide. So, uh, Tim and Tyler, thanks a ton for being on and joining us on the Fieldwork Podcast today. Thanks so much for having us. And now it's time on the podcast to check out what's going on in our voicemail. Zach, let's see what we got today. Hey, guys, I really enjoy your podcast. Uh, my name is Brian Anderson. I farm in northeastern south dakota um one thing i i keep trying to get through these people who talk about regenerative ag is the unbelievable benefit of using compost tea in your farming practice i have been doing this since the late 80s um i i i can't tell you the difference it makes in my soil. It's unbelievable how it restores the soil. It, my my organic levels have never been this high. I just keep on gaining it constantly. Anyway, I really enjoy your guys' this podcast. Keep up the good work. My thoughts on it at first are, what is he saying compost pee? Like, like compost tea, no tea. It's not compost pee. <laughs> I, I thought he was talking about phosphorus i'm like i awesome. i even googled it like what in the heck is compost pee no compost tea so yeah i definitely think that compost tea is something that can be really interesting for a lot of our listeners and the way to really get that soil re-energized get you off and running um so i, I really like that that's working out for you up there on your farm um, my thoughts there you know being able to find um, compost tea that works for you, whether it be the actual tea from the compost or just finding compost as a way to be able to get that livestock manure or other composted materials back on your farm. Good way to be able to get some nutrients out there, stimulate biology, build up organic matter, you know, store some of that carbon back into your soils as well. So the key thing there for me is, you know, finding any type of alternative to continue to implement sustainable ag on your farm is huge. There's not a one size fits all system here. Any way that you can continue to improve your footprint um, and optimize your profitability is huge. So kudos. So Mitchell, can you can you get compost tea, uh, you know, in large quantities? I mean, is that something that a, that a, a farmer with three, four, or five thousand acres can look at? Um, yeah. So the big thing there, um, and the big thing for me on compost tea is that it's looking at integrating a very diverse array of living microbes back onto your farm. So what they would do is you take, make a, make a compost, typically relatively small amount of compost, 
And then you put that compost in like a bag, essentially. Um, probably, I don't know if you, you'd kind of make a bag out of like, um, a cotton type of a bag or like a shirt or whatever, or just use a sack of some kind. And then, you know, just like you're making sun tea, put that bag down in like a thousand or 2000 gallon water tank and let it sit for a couple of days. Typically you would have an aerator on it to get oxygen into that system to be able to get those microbes going, keep it in an anaerobic condition. But essentially you're trying to brew the microbes that are in that compost and get them into the water. So then you can actually apply the tea, you know, as a liquid, as a foliar or in furrow or put it on, you know, with your herbicides or in replacement of a fungicide. So that's what they're going after. It's kind of like a make your own bugs in a jug type of a system, but it's not buying um, microbial products, you know, from a retailer. It's actually going out and kind of making your own. That that's interesting. It sounds to me like we could do an entire episode on this. A hundred percent could. And and back to like the scalability of that, I definitely think it could be very much scalable. Um, that basically it's just when you need, you know, a thousand gallons or 2000 gallons, three days from now, you start brewing that up and make your batch. It typically doesn't take that long. Um, the key thing though, is it's definitely, you know, there's some infrastructure to setting it up. There's a little bit of some art to it as well on being able to get things right. And, You know, you want to make sure that you're brewing up a lot of good guys and you don't end up with pathogens and such in there. So there's a little bit of uh, some things to be careful about, but I definitely think we could dig into that a lot more in the future. That's it for Fieldwork today. Thanks to all the people who helped make Fieldwork possible. Annie Baxter, Amy Scotchless Cole, Claire Jones, Noah Boston, Kristen Schmidt, Eric Romani, and Lauren Humpert. Our theme song is written and performed by Johnny Vince Evans with help from Corey Shrepp. And our website is fieldworktalk.org. We are also on YouTube at Fieldwork. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We cover them all. If you like our show, it'd be awesome if you would write us a review. And of course, we'd love to get a voicemail message from you that we can play on our show. Leave us a comment or question at 651-228-4810. That's 651-228-4810. And uh, now I need to go work on my resume and add my real job as a podcast host. You'd better get to work on that, Mitchell. I I can't imagine it's a very long resume, is it? No, it's not. I need all the help I can get. Yeah, and and I'm going to hop on Google and try and figure out what a resume is. (laughs) Deal. Well, until next time, thanks for joining us. I got to get out there to Northern California and get into that Central Valley. I I spent a half a day there one time and I was fascinated by it. So I got to get on some farms up there, see what it is you guys are doing. Let us know. We'll, uh, we'll give you some chickens. (laughs) That sounds delicious. I'm so excited. Zach is finally getting his chickens. It's going to happen, Zach. You got to get chickens on your farm. Your kids need something. Don't let my wife hear that. She'd order them by eight o'clock tonight.